Years ago, I was working at a, a company where we worked on civilian aircraft, uh, you know, corporate jets, Buddy Holly killers and puddle jumpers, stuff like that. And uh, a Buddy Holly killer, if you're not familiar, is, is a is a plane with a V-tail on the back that does not have anti-icing on the wings. <clears throat> Hence, he's no longer with us. But that's little, doctors used to like to buy them, and we so we. When we worked on them, we would call them V-tail doctor killers. So uh, everybody, ooh, okay. I'm just just being real with you. But we had this guy come in from, and I don't remember now. It's been so long ago. What he was doing, he came there and he was working on some warranty deal or something. I don't know. And then we went, we we got a break, and we went to the break room. We we're sitting down, and uh, everybody that worked there, of course, knew I was a pastor. And uh, I don't remember how it got started, but somehow we, the the conversation turned to the Bible, and um, <clears throat> the, don't, I don't I don't remember how this uh, came up. But I'm telling you this story so that I can hopefully knock the legs out from under one of the most heinous false doctrines that has ever been unleashed on the Christian world. And this man made some statement about. Um, black people and that i'm trying to remember how he worded it it's been so long but anyway he refer he referenced the curse of ham <clears throat> now i remember hearing that sort of thing in sunday school coming up and so i challenged the man i said where is that in the bible oh it's in there where well it's 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 in there you know we're talking about, we're about noah around the flood and all that and uh i said i'll be right back so I stood up from the break table, and I remember as I was going out the door, um, the guy goes, where's he going? And Boulash is sitting over his Cajun guy that worked with us. He goes, you messed up now. <laughs> He's a preacher. He's going to get his Bible. And thank you very much. Now we're going to get a Bible lesson for the rest of break. <laughs> so I went out and got my Bible, and I just put it in front of him. I said, fine, where Ham is cursed. And I said, I'll tell you what chapter you're looking for. And so he went there and he said, oh, here it is. And he read it and it says, curse be Canaan. I said, sir, there is no such thing as a Hamitic curse. It does not exist. It has been invented. It is a bad myth. It is uh, a bad extrapolation. And it is something that has been used to... Um, bolster the case for slavery and a bunch of other things around the world for at least the last couple hundred years. You won't find that in the church history more than a, a couple hundred years ago. So today we will run through those verses, and I hope to show you what they really mean, because they don't mean what certain people in the church world have said they mean. And once again, if you can find the curse of Ham anywhere in this Bible, then uh, i got a bridge I want to sell you. All right? So we're going to start today in Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 and 19. It says, The sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. Ham is the father of Canaan. You need now to ask yourself, why is that stuck in there? It's put in there for a reason. These are the three sons of Noah. And of them was the whole earth overspread. Now, the Bible makes no bones about the entire population of the world coming from Noah's three sons. And it shouldn't be hard to swallow if you believe that the entire pre-flood population came from just one couple. <clears throat> if you live several hundred years, guess what, ladies? You can have lots of kids. Joy, joy. It gives new meaning to the verse, you know, talking about blessed is a man whose quiver is full. It's not like you're starting your own basketball team or football team. you got your own army, you know. <clears throat> but in evolutionary theory, there had to have been one couple of almost everything to have evolved at the same time. What I mean by that is, you know, they think that this fish flopped up on the beach and then it figured out how to do this. And eventually, over millions of years, those turned to legs. We don't have a mechanism for that, but that's what, what happened. But here's the deal. In order for them to reproduce, 
one female and one male with all the parts working had to have flocked up on the beach at the same time, found each other, went on a date, got married, and then reproduced. That really takes the odds to something that you could, you know, I can't calculate. As you know, two years in Algebra 1, that's what you get from that. But <clears throat> that would have been a greater miracle than repopulating, repopulating the earth from a gene pool of just eight people. Most of the dispersion of the population came later. We're, we are dealing with Genesis, this last portion of Genesis 9 today and Genesis 10, which is known as the Table of Nations. I considered going from 9 to 11 because that's actually the chronological, uh, the way it works chronologically. Chapter 10 is what we call parenthetical. If you don't write that down, it means it's kind of a parenthesis. It's, it's stuck in there. It's kind of out of place, but it gives you um, some valid history. Verse 20 says, <clears throat> And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was covered within his was uncovered within his tent. Now this is the very first mention of wine in the Bible. However, if if what we have talked about as far as technology and all that, uh, there's no reason not to believe that wine wasn't around before the flood. Actually, other documents say that beer and wine were around the flood. Once again, you got a level of culture and technology. Uh, so therefore, if you got rich people, there's going to be wine. You got everybody else, probably going to be some beer. All right. So <clears throat> the evil of the people of Noah's day included much eating and drinking, which is characterized by Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 38. And it says, Noah became a husbandman, meaning he started a vineyard. And unfortunately, we read that um, <clears throat> he had a little too much to drink. All right, and then we see that Ham, it says that he was laying there in his tent with his nakedness uncovered. Now, this can also be a Hebrew idiom, and what I mean by that, when it says that someone saw their father's nakedness, it doesn't only mean that they walked in and he was passed out there like that. Sorry for the pictures in your head. But it also can mean that the wife was there also, all right, in a Hebrew idiom. So that gives you a little bit of better picture of what could have been going on. Then we have verse 20, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 22 says, And Ham, always the caveat here, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and, ha and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. So for the most part, this comes down, and you get people thinking all kind of weird stuff happened here. That There are other words in the Hebrew, just if it got weird, real crazy, that could have been used. But for the most part, what you have here is a lack of respect for Noah, Ham's father, and possibly his mother. The other two boys, he, he goes out and he's like, hey, man, you know what I just saw? He's kind of, it's a lack of respect. You don't go and say something like that about your dad, your mother, anyone else for that matter. He goes out, and so now you've got a glimpse into the way Ham thinks. Noah, of course, being his father over the years, has had several glimpses at the way Ham thinks, and he knows, of course, how Shem and Japheth also, also think. Something apparently about his father in this situation appealed to Ham. It appeals to a base nature, shows his nature, and apparently the nature of some of Ham's offspring. You, once again, you constantly hear this, father of Canaan, Ham, father of Canaan, Ham, the father of Canaan. And in the Bible, especially in the Hebrew side, the Old Testament, when something is repetitive, it's constantly being reiterated, it's done there for emphasis. And Genesis 9.24 says, And Noah, excuse me, Noah awoke from his wine, and knew somehow what <clears throat> excuse me his son had done to him. And he said, Curse be Canaan. Didn't say anything about Ham, to Ham, anything like that. Curse be Canaan, <clears throat> a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So what we're doing here is, this is not on Ham, this is about the descendants of one of one of many of Ham's offspring. 
and they're narrowed down, and they're for the most part localized in the promised land. And when you really check out, as we'll see as we continue to go on through the Old Testament, when you look at what um, the sons of Canaan, who they were, what tribes, what cultures and everything, there's one thing that stands out. They are all cultures of giants. These are the people that it, because they mostly inhabit the promised land. These are the groups of the people that God said, went to, tells uh, Moses and, and Joshua and all that, when you get there, and here's the part everybody doesn't like because it's not a kumbaya moment. When God says about certain peoples in certain cities and certain city-states, he says, when you get there, kill them all. Man, woman, and child. And in today's tolerance and PC world, oh, that is so horrible. God is obviously schizophrenic. How do you reconcile that with what Jesus said, rocking babies on his knee? Well, just remember now, just last week at church, he sat in the back row over whip, you know, and went postal in the place, turning over, you know. So Jesus is not just rocking babies on his knee. He did come as a suffering servant this time, but read about how he's coming next time. He's kicking tail and taking names next time. All right? He's got a vesture dipped in blood, and it's not his blood. It's those that are being judged. So why does God tell them to when you get to these places, just these people, you kill them all, man, woman, child, because they're giants? Well, what's so bad about a basketball team? It's not about that. It's about how you get the basketball team. And this basketball team was gotten due to, just like pre-flood, like once again, is God just? I'm going to ask you that. All right, you passed the test. If he is just, then the punishment fits the crime. So when something or someone or some group gets obliterated, it's because they did something real bad. This is not your run-of-the-mill sin, if you want to put it that way. They have crossed the line, and consistently the line that is being crossed when they do that is something from the heavenly realm has come down and crossed the line with someone, some people's, from the earthly realm, and that cannot be tolerated because now you have violated the law that God put down everything after its own kind. What is our kind? Is it American versus European versus South America? No, we're all humans. How do you tell if it's in its kind? If they can get together, get married, and have children, they're within their kind. If you only knew, or if people only knew how much, how little difference there was between me and Sean, it is, you can't even, it's so infinitesimal, you cannot even say it. It's, 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 it's crazy how small it is. All it takes to make a pigment in the skin darker or to make some other features different. That's all it takes. And we'll talk about how those came about once we get to the uh, Tower of Babel. But Noah woke from his wine. Why did I get off on all that? Because all of this is brought to bear when somebody's trying to make some sort of statement about Ham. It is Canaan. And when Israel comes into Canaan, there are certain groups, as I said, that are to be wiped out. They are all connected to this fallen angelic thing. Um, how did they get onto this side of the flood if they're always wiped out? My belief is, they, is there's something wrong with, with Ham's wife. They, had to, they chose those. Some texts say just a week, or so, a week or so before the flood. They had to come across genetically somehow. I don't see in Scripture uh, another bunch of fallen angels coming down and changing their estate. If you look at to the New Testament, when Jesus cast the, the demons out of the maniac at Gadara, and they're like, don't send us to our place before the time, they are terrified of that. That's where the fallen angels go. They're like, don't, don't send us down there. And Jesus said, okay. And he says, go into the pigs, which is devil ham. So, <laughs> ba-doom, Okay. And so they run and drown and says, all right. Okay, so that's why you have this, this, what people think is just the most cruel thing in the world. Others, regular people, Gentiles, 
when they get there, Israel is instructed to give them the right. Look, we'll sit out here. You got a right. Y'all talk it over. You can surrender and come under our flag or not. You got the option. Just like Jerry Clower talking about, you know, some people don't think coon hunting is fair. Because you send, send all these dogs out and they chase this coon through the swamp and he gets up in the, in the tree. And what's he supposed to do? And Jerry Clower pointed out, he said, it's fair because the coon does have an option. He can come down the tree, whip all those dogs and then walk off if he wants to. It's up to him. If you didn't get that, just think about it. So it says, Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant, a servant shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And unfortunately, these verses have been misconstrued in an attempt to support slavery or chattel, cattle, chattel slavery is what it's really called, the type that was here in the United States for about 400 years and other racial injustices over the years. The term slave comes from the word Slavic because they were small people caught always between bigger nations and they were um, always being conquered. And in the old world, just as in the Bible world, the Old Testament, once you've been conquered, you know, your options are limited. If you're, if you're not pretty, your options are really limited. If you're not a good-looking guy, you're not real smart, your options are really limited. You become a step-and-fetch it, as we would call it, on a construction project somewhere. Step and fetch it. I mean, step over there and fetch that for me. Bring it here. Y'all don't, never heard of that? Okay. I just kind of... Sometimes I say stuff, and y'all just kind of look at me like a calf staring at a new gate. You know, just... <laughs> so, if we look carefully, though, at verse 25, we'll see that Ham wasn't cursed. His... Grandson, I said son, his grandson Canaan was. Canaan was the father of the Canaanites. That's easy. Which for the most part inhabited the promised land when Israel entered it in the book of Exodus. At this point we should ask ourselves why such a curse over something like this? Why? Well, it was a bad situation, but, but why curse generations for something one man did? Him messed up. Why are you cursing all the grandchildren? That's a, that is a legitimate question. But it's most likely that Noah, knowing his sons and their sons, eventually spoke this because he knew of each one's tendencies. First of all, he says that Canaan will be the servant of a servant. This is, the phrase isn't a common one in the Old Testament. The word does mean lowest of servants. You can't get, you can't get around that. Some people try to, you know, say it's a stewardship, but... You really got to do some Hebraic gymnastics to get there, as far as I can tell. From the context surrounding the verses, it can be seen that all of the descendants of each of Noah's sons is being spoken of as we go through this. If we don't take the utterance this way, he's talking about offspring and everything else, then Noah was wrong. For example, Canaan was to be a servant of servants unto his brethren. All right? His brothers are not Shem and Ham, technically. They are Cush. Mizraim and Put. These were the fathers of Ethiopia, Egypt, and Libya. Now, as history bears out, the Canaanites were never slaves to the Ethiopians or the Libyans. They were only briefly enslaved by the Egyptians. Therefore, we have to look further for the answer. Um, um, why was, uh, it appears that Canaan's lineage was to be more... Um, how do I put this? Some people use the word steward, and that, that's not a bad word. But they were to be, they tended to be, let me put it this way, they tend to be the explorers and the conquerors and and that sort of thing. If you trace the flow of Ham's, all of his descendants, they go farther out than anyone else. They they conquer the the harshest of the lands from the title of the total continent of Africa to China to eventually North and South America. You get it? They go, they go, get out and conquer. They, all the Polynesian islands, all that South America fruit. All those massive cities in South America, Teotihuacan, Chichen Itza, all of these are people from the Hamitic line. And might I add, the largest pyramid in the entire world, Teotihuacan. The largest, dwarfs Giza. Looks just like the ziggurats 
what you would see as the Tower of Babel that we'll read about in the coming months. How do they get the same architecture with no internet halfway around the world? Because their people had seen one <clears throat> before they scattered. That's how you get things, um, religion and everything else spread worldwide. Canaan was cursed, but it was due to the actions of Ham. Each of the other boys of Noah were prophesied about, and therefore we must look at um, Ham's complete line, just not Canaan's immediate circle, as, is already, as a, has already been said. Being a steward, being a part of what humanity is, pinpoints what exactly the Hamitic nations were, were stewards of. Historically speaking, the Hamitic nations, that is the, the peoples that descended from Ham, have been the most apt to travel, explore, and conquer. They also have tended to have more of an agricultural bent to them. They have tended to prepare the way for others. And in this way, Canaan was a servant of Shem. And then also when Israel comes in to take over the promised land, they are in servitude to Israel because Israel does not do what was they were told to do, which is to kill all of them. And therefore, you have the book of Ruth and Haman. All right? Study that on your own. We'll get to that one day. Genesis 9, 26. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. The Canaanite nations surrounding Israel eventually became subservient to Israel. They were also used by God to subdue the land because it had hornets and giant tigers, uh, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my, all that sort of stuff. They were also used to, to subdue the land before Israel came in the promised land. As for Shem, the Shemites or Semites, Semitic peoples, Israelites, and others, uh, which include the Hebrews, Arabs, Assyrians, Persians, and Syrians, as well as others, have always had a tendency to be religiously motivated. We're painting with a big brush here. But that's what this is, is a broad prophecy, if you will. All three of the world's largest religions come from these people. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And from this we see that Semitic tendencies have as a whole been towards spiritual matters. Noah could see this. And as for Japheth, we see that he had a different bent or different tendencies. Verse 27 says, May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Well, as we look at this verse, we see that Japheth was to be enlarged. This isn't just geographically, for the Hamitic peoples of the world cover vast portions of the earth, more than, than Japheth's uh, descendants. Historically, we see that the Japhetic peoples would eventually become the Europeans, for the most part. They've always been, at some point, an intellectual or scientific group, the Greeks, Romans, Persians, uh, Athens and Sparta are where we the, were, are considered to be the beginnings of modern Western civilization. They have always been the ones leading the way technologically as well as in the realm of philosophy. We also see that Japheth would dwell in the tents of Shem, and the Japhethites would eventually dwell in the spiritual houses or tents of Shem. These nations eventually became the ones who uh, that predominantly believed and spread the gospel after Jesus was rejected by the Jews, he told the disciples to go to the Gentiles, and that is primarily what Paul did. So, in a nutshell, Ham explored and conquered due to more of a naturalistic bent. Shem was in charge of spiritual matters, while the, some of the intellectual matters were left to Japheth. All three are necessary for things to get done. The recognition of these traits was most likely what drove Noah to speak these prophecies, and we also see that uh, from this how cultures grow and form. That's very important when we get down to our application part of it. The chapter then ends by telling us how long Noah lived after the flood and how long he lived overall. Verse 9, uh, 28 says, And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, so all the days of Noah, Noah were 950 years, and he died. And there's his epitaph. Now, if you look at the handout, there's still some on the back, with the timeline, you'll see that Abraham, he had a few years he could have talked to Noah. That is something else. That is something else. When you could talk to your great, 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 great grandfather, whatever, before the flood, 
I mean, most of the, most of the people prior to the flood were able to go at Adam and go, Hey, man, <clears throat> why did you hose this up? I just spent all day trying to weed my turnip greens. And it's all on you. And hopefully he didn't go, See that woman over there? <laughs> and she probably hit him with a broom at that point. And she was right to have done it. Men have uh, been enamored with the quest to find out uh, when men began to populate the earth. I would like to recommend a book. I cannot remember the author's name at this point, but I'll get it for you. I'll show it to you. It's called After the Flood, and it goes through all the ancient writings and traces all the peoples of, for the most part, Europe, and just this guy's focus, all the way back to the flood, using names of tribes and this sort of thing. Anthropologists and archaeologists spend their lives searching for the answer to the riddle. Current theory on the subject has it that man uh, first evolved in the Rift Valley of Africa and, and fanned out from there. Geographically speaking, that isn't far off because the Rift Valley is not really that far from uh, what we call the Promised Land. But chronologically and anthropologically, they have missed the mark by a long shot. And if you knew what they actually discovered when they found the first man is actually a monkey, and part of it was here, and part of it was way over yonder somewhere, just a couple of bones. And they said, oh, take that. There you go. There's the first man. You know, I want to see the train that hit that monkey, but you can't, you know, that's just not good detective work there. So, wouldn't it be great, though, if we had an ancient document that told us just how and when men began to populate the earth? Wouldn't it be fascinating if this text told us where it all started, and then attached a timeline to it. Well, that document exists in what we call the Bible, and Genesis 10 holds that record preserved for posterity by eyewitness testimony. Many would say that it's only myth or legend. But the evidence, however, shows the contrary. And here's what I want you always to see. If the Bible is true in Genesis, then there are certain things we should be able to observe. This is how you confirm things. If there was actual flood that covered the whole globe, then the highest mountains should have fossilized sea creatures on them. Guess what? They do. We should find bones of, of, of old animals covered in mud and fossilized. And we do. Along with a bunch of other stuff. We should see all of those things. And that's what we do. That's what we see. First of all, if the history of man in the, in the earth and earth is as the Bible claims, then we shouldn't see any signs of civilization over 4,500 years old. Guess what? We don't. You shouldn't find any trees older than that. Guess what? You don't. So we don't have any writing. We don't have any civilization. We don't have any trees. And don't get me on tree rings. We'll talk about that one day. We shouldn't see any trees, and we don't. If the Bible is true, then we should see population levels about where we see them now. After all, if man has been reproducing for millions of years, the planet should be much more crowded than it is. And don't tell me it's overcrowded. I don't hear that. A few years ago, you could, you could place the entire world population inside the city limits of Jacksonville, Florida. Now, that's not something you would want to do. But we're not overcrowded. Okay. So we, if the Bible is true, then we should be able to trace man's existence back to one couple in one place at one specific time. And guess what? This has been done. Mitochondrial Eve is what they call her. They, you know, that's just that's something they use. But you take the genetic load and you take the mutations and you take the DNA from a particular family. The study was actually done on the family of Tsar Nicholas when the communists took over. Um, and they traced all this back, and they, they decided that the, the mutations in the, the, what they call the genetic load, the mutations in the DNA happened a lot more rapidly than we once thought. Why is that important? Because when they first did the study, they said, oh, well, it takes a long time to get all these mutations. Therefore, mankind is gazillions of years or millions, whatever the number is they use. After they checked the Tsar's family, you know what? They said, all this could happen in less than 10,000 years. Right. You figured it out. 
You know what? I read it a long time ago. You know, there's no nothing there to figure out. Somebody said it this way. One of these days, all the scientists and philosophers that are chasing after the knowledge of God and beginnings and all this stuff, all this stuff, all the different um, areas they're studying to find the beginning of the universe and humanity, all this. One of these days, as they climb that mountain, they're going to get over the top and see a whole bunch of theologians sitting there waiting on them. <laughs> Could have saved you a lot of trouble. All you had to do is read the Bible. If the Bible is true, then we should be seeing exactly what we see. And the great thing is that we can stop looking for answers to the questions that have already been answered. Some 4,300 years ago, a global flood occurred, and when it was over, eight people got off an ark along with a bunch of animals. This family began to repopulate the earth. Eventually, this family grew into a settlement. That then turned into a village, then into a community. From there, it became a town and then a city. Then large landowners began to rule over others and eventually became despots. The same thing happened in, in, in ancient Europe. The pattern is played out time and again in history, and we have a record of it in Genesis 10, 10 starting out with another, here's a word, toldot. It's not spelled that way. Toledoth is how you say it in Mississippi. But if you're Hebrew, it's toldot, a word we talked about many times. And once again, that toldot is a signature. It's a point in the text in which someone has taken, your father takes the, the family Bible, so to speak, as it were, off the coffee table and says, here, son, I've recorded all this up to now. And it's your turn. I can't even see to write anymore. Keep start writing. That's what a told out is. So when you see in the generations of so-and-so, and this is the book of the generations, that, that's a told out. It's now been handed off to someone else. These are the generations, there it is, that's the phrase, of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I'm trying not to keep it. I know some of y'all, this is probably somewhat boring, but we'll get to the story parts in a little bit. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and under them were sons born after the flood. Once again, as it was stated, Noah had three sons. That's why they, they named the TV show after that from the 70s, you know, My Three Sons. These boys and their descendants can be traced throughout history. You ever heard of Jupiter? Well, the Semitic languages don't have vowels or didn't back then. You spell Jupiter and Japheth the same way. They were seen to be famous. You know, they were, they were, they were historical figures. And eventually the pagans make gods out of regular people, or people that have really, you know, uh, done something in life. These names aren't made up by some ancient scribe writing a story. These names and the people ascribed to them can be traced historically and can even be recognized in many cases still today. The first son to have his family listed is the oldest boy, Japheth. Sons of Japheth. And we have the uh, the family trees back there. You can pick one up. Sons of Japheth, Gomer, Shazam, <laughs> golly, not him, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tyrus, and the sons of Gomer. So Gomer Pyle had kids, Ashkenaz, and Riphath, and Togarma, and the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families and their nations. Now, at Noah's time, everything, everybody had the same tongue. Once again, this is parenthetical. So you would actually finish chapter 9, go and read chapter 11, and then come back to chapter 10. From history, we find that Gomer, Magog, and Meshach would eventually settle the area of Asia Minor or Turkey as we know it today, as well as the surrounding areas that that um, hung around, that are be between the Black and the Caspian Seas. Now, if you are one of these people that gets your Bible prophecy from one of these little paperbacks that get sold here and there, where there's very little serious critical scholarship, they're going to tell you that Gomer is Germany, uh, Tubal is Tobolsk in Russia, and that Magog is Moscow. Here's the problem. Historically speaking, when it comes to serious scholarship, that's not the case. It sells good little prophecy books. When it comes to serious scholarship, that is not the case. Where do they live at this time? These guys, Turkey, all, all of them. And that figures into where you're dealing with the Antichrist. It also figures into what I believe should be a revised version 
of the, the statue in Daniel's dream of the head of gold and all that. Javan would eventually become the Grecian people. They're the main players that we can relate to today. We also see that these brothers, you see the word Kaftarim in there. Kaftarim is speaks of Crete, which is where the Philistines came from. That's where the giants, many of the giants came from after the flood. That's also the seed of Greek mythology and all the weird animals that you read about there. Um, um, it says that they, let me read that again. These brothers were divided by their tongues after their families in their nation. So as God scattered everybody, we'll see the family lines kept the same language or something close to it, whereas the others didn't. But what happens when you cannot communicate? You're in trouble, guys. You're supposed to know. No, because they can't communicate, people separate, and from there tend to become clannish or tribal. They eventually grow into nations that are isolated. Now, once you've isolated yourself, either geographically or because of culture, now, and everybody's marrying within this group, now you get isolated physical traits and features. Nose, hair, skin, ears, eyes, height lack of height, whatever the case may be. Hair, lack of hair, whatever the case may be. <clears throat> but that's, that's essentially what happened at the flood. The, then you, they grow into nations with their own cultures. Then the cultural differences serves to create further barriers between neighboring peoples. We all know how this works. We live in a big city. The sons of Japheth, though, for the most part, were the forerunners of the European peoples. Genesis 10, verses 6 through 10. And the sons of Ham are Cush, Mizram, and Put, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush, Seba, or Sheba, that's Arab, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Ramah, and Sabdika. And it, see, here's the great thing about this. If I mispronounce them, y'all will never know. And Cush begat Nimrod. We'll talk about him next month because that's really not a proper name. It is a title in a sense. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And you go, what does that mean? That becomes, son, you're going to be a mighty hunter. That You buy your son all the latest guns and bows and, you know, the, the rifle where you can see that deer about three miles away and he doesn't have a clue what's going to hit him. You know, in the night vision and he's hunting over a pile of corn, all that kind of stuff. You say, you're going to be a mighty hunter like him. So they do all that kind of stuff. Or sending your kid off, you're going to be a good baseball player like Willie Mays. You know, that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. And the beginning of his kingdom, Nimrod's, whom I believe to be Gilgamesh. But in the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Echad, and Calni in the land of Shinar, which is essentially Mesopotamia. I'm not going to go into all that Nimrod means, let us rebel. So it's somewhat a title here, not necessarily a proper name. But I'm not going to get into that right now. We'll talk about that next week. Out of that land, what land? The land where um, Nimrod had his, his city-states and his empire. Out of that land went forth Asher. You heard of Assyria? They're the sons of Asher. Assyria, you get it? And builded Nineveh. Where ISIS is nowadays, nowadays, now today. And the city Rehoboth and Calah, and reason between Nineveh and Calah, and the same as the great city. And Mizram begat Ludim, and Anamim, and Leabim, and Naphtahim, and Pethruzim, and Kalushim, out of whom came Philistim and Kaphtarim. Philistines, Kaphtarim, Greek island, Crete. Okay, we already covered that. And Canaan begat Sidon, that's also a Mediterranean city on the seacoast, and his firstborn, and Heth, who's the father of the Hittites, which is a massive kingdom up north of Israel and reached into modern-day Turkey. And the Havite, and here we go, Canaan, Canaan's boys, and the Havite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvidite, and the Nemorite, and the Hamathite, and the Termite, and... Afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. And the border of the Canaanites... Why do they keep focusing on Canaan? That is where we're going with this every time. This is a major deal. That's why all this weird stuff we've been talking about. And boy, I get the calls and the questions. And no, I'm not smoking crack. I'm just telling you. 
all the ancient stuff that most of you probably never read points to that way. And it all lines up with this. There's a focus on these people here. These are the sons, oh, excuse me, and the borders of the Canaanite was from Sidon, if you're looking on the map, is northwest on the coast of the Mediterranean. As thou comest unto Gerar, unto Gaza, that's the Gaza Strip, where the Palestinians are today. And thou goest unto Sodom, which is you go due east, south of the Dead Sea, and there's a plain there, and Gomorrah, and Adma, and Zoabim, unto, even unto Lashia. And just as trend analysis, I'm figured that's back up north toward the mountains of Dan. These are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. In verse 11, we see the, same, the name Asher. He was actually a son of Shem. Here we see that he founded a city but was run out of the region by Nimrod. Asher goes on to be the father of the Assyrian Empire. The attached map, or you'll see that given back there. It might be up here. I can't see behind me right now. The attached map gives the original locations of all these people groups. Some of the most notable. Cush. Sudan, the Nubian people, these are people in the north, they're also people in northern parts of India called the Hindu Kush. But Kush, the Nubians, Ethiopia, was a humongous kingdom. It's not just a little landmass you see there, it was a humongous kingdom full of trade and, and, and gold and all that sort of stuff. Mizram is Egypt, Put is Libya, Philistine, that's Philistine, Sidon, the Sidonians, which I say is northwest of Jerusalem. Heth, the Hittites, some of which are believed to have migrated to the far east of China. The Jebusites, Jebus, Jebusalem, Jerusalem. These are the original Canaanites that inhabited Jerusalem. David never did quite conquer them. Therefore, when you go to Israel today, if you go to Jerusalem, there's a place called the city of David that he built right next to it. And they were neighbors and they began to deal with each other. The Sinites or Sinites, Many scholars believed these to be the far eastern Chinese Asian peoples that eventually would inhabit the north and south America. Canaanites, we know them. They're talked about all the time. Occupy the promised land, but were also spread abroad. Some are thought to have spread out also to the far east. So the Hamitic peoples also spread clean to their own tribal groups as they went, once again, for just simply for communication purpose. Purposes. For the most part, they settled Africa, the Sinai, the Arabian Peninsula, as well as the Far East, and eventually the Americas. Last but not least, we have the sons of Shem, or the Semitic nations. I'm trying to get you all out of here on time. Verse 21 says, Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber. That's not me. The brother of Japheth, the elder. That's how we know Japheth is the oldest. We, um, we also read just earlier that Noah's youngest son is the one that found him in the tent. Therefore, if Japheth is the oldest and Ham is the youngest by process of elimination, it's called logic. Unfortunately, it's never, not taught in schools anymore. Shem is the middle boy. The children of Shem, Elam, and Asher, and Arphax, Sad, and Lud, and Aram, and the children of Aram is Uz, and Hol, and the Uz, that's where Job, uh, Job is from, and Hol, and Gether, and Mash, they named a TV show after him too. And Arafat said, Beget Selah, and Selah beget Eber. The word Hebrew comes from the name Eber, meaning to cross over. And that's where we get the word Hebrews, Eberus, Hebrews. They became Hebrews when they crossed the Jordan. Lud, those are the Lydians. Aram or Arameans or Syrians. Uz, once again, is the land that Job called home. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. And I always think about the famous soccer player. But that one, that was Pele. Uh, Pele, for in his day, that's the only soccer player I know, and honestly, the only one I care to know. Uh, for in his days, got you, Jason. For in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Jockton. Now, because of this, you can't overlook it. We can assign a relative date to this by looking at the pull-out timeline that we have back there. In the generation of Pele, the earth was divided. That's the speaking of the Tower of Babel. Some people say, no, that's when one continent was broken up into many. If that's the case, then you've got another worldwide cataclysmic flood. And God said that couldn't happen. So that could not have been happening then. The continents being pulled apart would have happened during the flood. Uh, some scholars are quick to, like I said, to sign the vision of breaking up the supercontinent Pangaea. I've explained why that doesn't seem to make sense. Um, 
But we do have two other possibilities. It can either speak of the division of languages spoken of in Genesis chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel, and or it can also refer to a vision such as the drawing of boundaries, such as what surveyors do. And we read elsewhere that God appointed the peoples in their places. So if you want to throw those two in there together, but I do know this, it is at least referencing the, the, the Tower of Babel incident that we'll read about next time. All right, I believe that both ideas are plausible. I'm not going to argue. You can pick out which one you want. The rest of the chapter then gives us the lineage of Shem. And Joktan beget Almadad and Sheleph and Hazard, that guy, and Jerah and Hadram and Uzal and Dikla and Obal and Abimel and Sheba and Ophir and Havilah and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. And the dwelling was from Mesha as thou goest unto Sephar, a mountain of the east. And these are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues and their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nation. And by these were the nations divided in the earth. Guess what? After the flood. There we go. The Semitic nations for the most part stayed in that region. Verse 32 makes the same statement that verses 5 and 20 make, which infers that the nations were scattered along family trees. That is, the Japhetic peoples had a similar language. The Hamitic peoples had a similar language. And these would, of course, change over time. And the Semitic groups had a similar language. From their different dialects and their cultural anomalies, uh, they, these are natural developments as they're spreading out and isolating. It also accounts for the results of Genesis chapter 11, which is, like I said, out of place chronologically. You can get a map and the family tree back there as a handout. Now... What does all this got to do with us? Y'all can wake up now because this is the application part. <laughs> what I'd like to leave with you today is that Noah, as the father of these boys, was responsible for their upbringing. Old folks where I'm from would call it home training, something that is lacking, I believe, nowadays. He was responsible for structuring the culture of the home Noah was. Gentlemen, we as fathers are responsible for structuring the culture in our homes. When we structure the culture in our homes, we therefore can change the culture in our subdivision and just go on out. God has given us a book that tells us how to be good husbands and fathers. We also need to see how structuring the culture of our own house affects the culture of those down the line because it moves out in concentric circles. We are to be a light unto those around us in our little sphere of influence. This is one way we change the culture around us. Noah was by all accounts a good father and a godly man. He was an example to his family and those around him. He was a preacher of righteousness, we read. But he was also able to see the tendency of his sons. Each of these boys set the stage for succeeding generations. What does that tell us? Your family's got a bad cycle, you can stop it. Or at least give it a hiccup where it's got to try to jump. Each person, each man set the stage for succeeding generations. The prophecies that he utters here show us how leadership in the home is crucial for the well-being of generations to come. We start it now. And it can mess up. I mean, everybody's a free moral agent at some point. But hey, we've got to do what we can. So I want to ask you, gentlemen, do you want to be the do you want the best for your children and your grandchildren? Of course you do. If so, then lead your children. Not tell them go to church. Take them to church. Plug in the church. Let them see mommy and daddy active in the church. Not pew potatoes. Not Charlie Church goer. You know, plugged in and active. Be an example. Let them see you in church and see you active. Let them see you reading your Bible. Let them see you be, being kind and loving to their mother. You can be a biblical man. That means you can be a tough guy, but it also means to your wife and your children you are tender and loving, though you're not afraid to do what you've got to do when you've got to do it. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It doesn't say when they're teenagers, brain damage won't set in. <laughs> that happens. Then reality and the real world set in, and they go, Wow, I have some responsibilities. I can't do this all day. And video games all day, i got to make a living and pay for my own stuff. That tends to snap them too, right quick. 
So how we raise them has a good deal to do with how successful they will be both spiritually and in the secular world. Be a man. Structure the culture of your house in a godly manner. In this way, you're going to be a blessing to your children, your grandchildren, or your great-grandchildren and those around you. You have to understand that God has a plan and that He will go to great lengths to make sure it's carried out. You know what it's like. Don't make me come in there when you've told your kids to do this. Don't make me come in there. My dad told me that one time, and I was going to be cool, and I wedged the chair up under the doorknob. And he realized, he said, if I have to destroy that chair to get in this room, I'm going to have to destroy you when I get into the room. And I was, I, as I was hopping out my bedroom window, the back of the chair shattered. He caught me on the back 40, and it, didn't, it went downhill from there. But anyway... All because, you know what? I didn't want to go to church that day. <laughs> but God has to say, He gives us marching orders, and then He has to say, don't make me come down there. We've seen what happens when He has to come down here. Have we been rebellious in our own lives and hindered God, hindered God's plan? Are we so busy building our own little kingdom that we have ignored God's mission for us? Language and communication are essential to carry out most of God's commands. And it's necessary that we engage others if we are to carry out God's will for our lives. We have to get out of our own little boxes to do this. And that's where we don't get comfortable. We're uncomfortable. We aren't to stay huddled in our own little worlds. That's why God scattered the people over the earth in the first place. As the people scatter, they live their lives. They're no different than anyone else. We sometimes have a tendency to compartmentalize our lives. We have our regular secular lives. And then we have our Christian Sunday church lives. And those two should not be separate. They should be homogenized, if that's the correct word, into, into one so that the course of our lives is directed by God's plans for us. Now, that is an adventure. And we go about our business, we go about our bu- as we go about our business, we impact other people's lives for the glory of God. That is what living the Christian life is about. So how do we go about living our lives? What are we supposed to do about our lives? We ask God to tell us. We pray about it, and we are sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Which brings me to a fellow that I used to play a little baseball against, who is now... Uh, or last time I checked, was a baseball coach at one of the premier baseball teams in the nation as far as college goes. And you might be surprised to hear that is Mississippi State University. Lane was uh, went to school with my wife. We played against each other. He went on to play college ball and then went on. To, he was a college coach. Now, I was a high school coach. I'm thinking, Ooh, I'd love to be a college coach. But he goes on, and he's, teach, he's coaching at a good school in a great conference. There's only one conference. We all know what that is. And um, he's already coaching there, and he takes a job at Kansas State. Now, they play basketball, and they play a little football. Well, they don't play baseball. It's too cold. I mean, it's just not. All right, and, it, we're, and all of us are sitting around, why would he take that job? Why do you go there? Why do you go from a winning program to one nobody's ever heard of? Why do you do that? And he's not even the head coach at this time. Why would you do that? And Lane came back and he said, you know, God led me to do it for my family. And, of course, at that point, I got to, ooh. But he made, he made a decision. And then God, of course, led him to the promised land, which is Starkville, Mississippi. And now they're ranked <clears throat> number four in the nation. Um, so, at any rate, hosting, regional, all that good stuff. Um, So at any rate, the point I'm trying to make is he went and did something that does not make any sense career-wise, but it made perfect sense to him God-wise. And then God rewarded him and brought him back to the SEC, you know, because God's an SEC fan. (laughs) So ask God what he wants you to do and then do it. And as you go through your day, ask God to put you in the right place at the right time to minister to someone. And your life will then change one day at a time. And I've reached the bottom of my nose. And y'all are glad. So anyway, if y'all would, there's a lot of application there. It's not the most spiritual feel-good type stuff, but I'm not a feel-good type of guy all the time. But you get the point. 
I want you to see that everything we've discussed today is is borne out historically. It's borne out, if they, we did touch on science, it's borne out scientifically. This book is correct. It is right. The history of everything we know is in here. You can believe that. And because of that, then we're building the cumulative case for faith throughout the book. And we, gentlemen, we can choose Noah as our pattern, at least in this sense, um, and all that good stuff. So if y'all would, bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we do. Thank you, Father, for so much. If, of all the provision you've given us, the grace you've given us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and his work, Lord, we, of course, we thank you for all that. I thank you for the mountains and mountains of evidence you've given us in your word so that we don't have to move in blind faith, as some would say. We have all the evidence, and the secular evidence backs it up also. And we thank you for that, Lord God. You've given us a credible faith, not a blind faith. And we thank you for that, Lord God. And I ask that we as, as men in our homes, Lord God, that this would especially touch us today, that we would structure, take the time to structure the culture of our households, to be loving husbands, tender and loving. When we have to be, as a parent, Lord, that we would be tender and loving. But when it's time to, to discipline, Father, that we would also do that too, because not to discipline is just the greatest sin, Lord God, is crossing the line in the other direction. Lord, help us to build a culture in our homes that then affects the culture of this body and the areas around us, Father, and then eventually Atlanta and on out. Father, that's what we ask you to do. Lord, I ask that as men we would step up to the plate and do that. And Lord God, for that opportunity, we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In Jesus' name I pray.